Well, you know things are getting back to normal when the trip boat is out for a Sunday lunch. But of course, things aren't really getting back to normal. What we've got is a system where we're easing the lockdown because the economy is desperate and businesses are doomed to fail. And they're doomed to fail because there isn't the support that there perhaps should be in potentially a once in a lifetime catastrophic event such as the COVID-19 pandemic. There is enough money to pay people not to have to expose themselves to the virus. But that money is in the hands of probably about 2% or less of the population. Were we to tax the rich, the poor would not have to die. Let's leave that little thought with you for a little while. Anyway, garden, doing really well. Today I have mainly been assessing the overall catastrophic consequences of our power surge two weeks ago. And uh, it's not good. It really isn't good. Keep finding all the little bits, bits and pieces. Um, but anyway, I guess the girls, the girls keep us going, don't you girls? <sighs> Strange times. Yesterday, for the first time in, since, well, since March, pubs reopened. I know free, well, licensed premises. Two of them I know really well, and one of them I know through someone on the interweb. The two I know really well are Coles Corner in Sheffield and the Dorothy Pax, which is a bar. Uh, not very far away, actually. Just out, just out past, past there. Uh, where that boatyard is down there. A little bit further, Victoria Keys, Dorothy Pax, lovely little bar. Um, hello Richard, by the way, if you watch this rubbish, which I doubt, he's got a life. Uh, and the brew shed in Retford, which I know through online. I've never met the guy, um, but yeah, we got got to got to know each other in Eland. Actually, that sounds a bit druggy, doesn't it? And all of those three places I know have put in into action a strategy which is above and beyond what has been required by the government. Uh, as some of you will know. I have been kind of a little bit involved on the on the discussions um, from Public Health England and a few other bodies, mainly because of my background. <coughs> Excuse me, that's not COVID, that's dust. For those who don't know, my background was very much, I got involved with the NHS, working with drug misusers, drug users, misusers. I include alcohol within that. And in the mid-80s, we had this thing come along called, what well, was originally called GRID. Then it changed its name to AIDS, thankfully. And HIV AIDS has been kind of like the core of my work focus for 30 and some <laughs> years, about 34, 35 years. HIV AIDS is something which is completely avoidable. So is COVID-19. But the cost of that is behavioural change. Behavioural change back in the 80s meant that, predominantly, two things. One, don't share needles and syringes. Now, injecting drug users who were sharing needles and syringes, weren't really at the forefront of anyone's attention. We didn't have drug services as such. Uh, and we knew that providing clean injecting equipment, works as they're known, would substantially reduce the transmission of HIV amongst injecting drug users. And I was a part of a group of, of people around the country uh, 
who set up the very first needle and syringe exchanges. That was the single most effective means of reducing the transmission of HIV amongst drug users. Now remember, drug users, it's not just drug users, drug users tend to sort of fuck non-drug users and uh, etc. Um, and so the other area that we initially focused on was reducing the transmission of HIV uh, amongst gay men and men who have sex with men. Those are two different categories, by the way. And we knew that the use of condoms could reduce the transmission of HIV. Now, realistically, guys, and a friend of mine put this very well, gay men needed condoms as much as they needed tampons. Condoms were for preventing pregnancy, predominantly pre preventing pregnancy. We knew that as a barrier, they would also prevent things like gonorrhea, syphilis, etc. But gonorrhea and syphilis were fairly curable. HIV wasn't. So back in those early days, well, mid-80s, one of my jobs was talking to commercial sex workers, prostitutes, who were injecting drugs and then they were effectively selling their sex, selling their body in order to fund their drug habit and then potentially passing on HIV to their customers uh, who were then going home having sex with their wives and girlfriends. So again, it's that hidden economy. We had to try and try and get in contact with sex workers to teach them how to put condoms on. Similarly, gay men and men who had sex with men. I lived at the time, lived and worked on the south coast in Brighton, which is kind of like the gay capital of the UK. And, and loved it, I have to admit. I lived, uh, I lived actually in Kemp Town, which is the, the main gay area. Most of my friends that I sort of worked with were, were a part of the gay scene. I used to go to gay nightclubs because I liked the music. Uh, I went to see Divine, Hazel Dean. I used to uh, tout my little mobile disco around to hotels that uh, were all staffed by gay men. So I got I knew the gay scene, but working in that environment was completely different. Going down to the bushes on Brighton Seafront to talk to men who have sex with men about perhaps wearing a condom, you're likely to get your head kicked in. Similarly, talking to going to talk to prostitutes about perhaps using condoms there was a number of times that I got stopped by the police <laughs> asking what what I was doing my colleagues were always having to explain themselves now that was a difficult time we had to affect behavioral change and it's the same now COVID-19 isn't going to go away we are not going to have a vaccine in the near to immediate future we're not what i think will happen is we will deal with the causes uh, sorry this will deal with the the um we will deal fuck me i'm not used to doing such a long piece to camera or well, not even to camera we will deal with the symptoms in exactly the same way as we did with hiv we still haven't got a vaccine for hiv we can prevent the spread of it a little bit but we will deal with the symptoms. So with HIV, it's things like PCP, uh, Parkosis sarcoma, um, Carposis sarcoma, CP, PCP, pneumocystis pneumonia, and a whole range of other conditions that we can now treat. So the likelihood is that with, with HIV infection, you will die with it rather than from it. And I think that's what we're going to get to with COVID-19. We will treat the, uh, the, the bilateral uh, pneumonia, which is the predominant cause of death associated with COVID-19 although there are there are a number of others that we're, that we're starting to recognize behavioral change and it's going to take uh, it's going to take a lot of uncomfortable discussions I do a lot of stuff around uh, sex behavioral uh, attitudes within sex and relationships stuff around consent 
stuff around the kink scene, stuff around what's known as edge, uh, all around consent and negotiation and about breaking down barriers, which is why the two girls here, uh, Florence and Polly, are always kind of like done up in what some people might think is provocative attire. But is it? If they choose to wear something like that, and obviously, yeah, okay, these are mannequins, but the questions remain about how do we view, how do we view women who might choose to dress like that? Now, this is a part of that cognitive process. How do we view ourselves within the context of COVID-19? SARS-CoV-2, as we should really call it, that's the virus. COVID-19 is the presenting condition. And we're going to have to look about, very seriously, our contact with other humans for a very long time. And that is not going to be at all easy. We are used to, I am, and this is the thing, and this is what, this is what I'm finding really difficult. Since mid-March, I haven't been able to hug my friends. That's what I do. I am huggy. I do hug. I think a hug can convey more than words ever can. But I haven't been able to do that. I hug patients, my predominant, up until COVID-19, when I was kind of pulled into some of these chatty discussion groups. My main focus with patients was... In, in terms of palliative care, working with terminally ill patients. My two main areas of interest through the Made by Martin stuff, you go to made, madebymartin.co.uk, money I raise there is to support groups which are aimed at providing a support structure for uh, terminally ill patients and also mentally uh, affected individuals. Mental health is something that we always kind of like to conveniently skirt around but it is also now on the verge of reaching pandemic status mental health issues associated with covid19 are going to be along with the economic crisis the two main areas that will be linked to covid19 apart from covid19 itself if that makes sense so that's kind of a little bit about my background and why i do what i do and why this now sunday the 5th following the first night of the pubs opening and everybody has seen some of the things on the tv and there's a police officer who tweeted that after a few drinks people don't understand social distancing Whew, yeah bear shit in the woods as my mate ross said uh it is something that we're gonna have to get to grips with but to the dorothy packs to cole's corner and to the brew shed chris harrison um they have done everything that they can in excess of the expectations in order to protect their staff and to protect their customers we will see a change over the next few months and we will see drinking culture change by necessity i'd love to be able to go out to a couple of our favorite restaurants but i can't at the moment i won't do it not only because theoretically i should have been shielding but i didn't go for the chemo um but um but until we get a control mechanism in place where we can safely say that we have minimised the risk of infection from SARS-CoV-2, we should all be on our guard. All the time. Because the virus, the virus don't care. The virus will just do what it does. It's doing its job. And provided we do our job properly, we can probably beat it. This has been one of those strange videos that I never thought I'd really be wanting to make, especially on a Sunday. But I just wanted to clarify a few things. Oh, and the other thing is, I haven't sworn through this video. My YouTube channel is usually a mix of things to do with boozy bits, boaty bits, boathousey bits, um, burnty woody bits. These are Lichtenbergs, which are made by passing stupidly high current through an electrolyte and making fractals onto wood that's my thing that's and and it's my release this youtube channel is is me trying to make life a little bit more interesting for other people by being me this video now is as i would be speaking professionally this video now is 
as I would justify some factors in a meeting. My normal videos are me being me. I'm of that generation that I was the first person ever in my family to go to university. I was not only the first person in my family ever to get a degree, I was the first person in my family ever to get a doctorate. I actually got two, I was paid by the NHS to do it, it's wonderful. And I was the first person in my entire family ever to be appointed as a professor. But I'm still a little cheeky chappy cockney geezer who fucking swears a lot. So there's those two sides of me. The side of me that I like to, I like to share on this channel generally as being me that was how that was what i that was who i was who I, who i am but along with that also is the professional academic health worker stroke researcher stroke professor both of those i think are, are interesting but when i swear i'm swearing from the heart and similarly when i do videos like this I'm kind of doing it from the heart, but from the professional heart as well. And the reason I want to, to clarify that is I know some people will say, oh, I don't like potty mouths, I don't like swearing. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. I, I appreciate that. I understand that. But I will not make judgments, value judgments, based on basic moral concepts. I never have and I never will. I haven't done when I was working with commercial sex workers. I haven't done when I was working with outrageous um, uh, 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 drugs users who, who... Well, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. I don't when I was working with police who were corrupt. I haven't done when I was working with all sorts of people. I don't make those judgments, okay? That's not my job to make judgments. You want to make judgments about me? Okay, that's fine. I'm not going to uh, yeah, I'm not going to challenge that because that's that's you, that's not me. But I won't make a judgment until it comes to something which is detrimental to somebody else's health and well-being. That's when I'll make a judgment that it is probably wrong. And going out getting pissed fighting in the street spitting at coppers, right? That's wrong. So we need to focus on our behavioural change. And this is now 17, nearly 18 minutes of your life you won't get back. But I hope it has been slightly more interesting uh, than perhaps me just wandering around the garden outside and showing you boat wiring and swearing at boat wiring that I can't figure out and stuff. Right, that's 18 minutes. Be safe. Be well.